Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. This happens to be episode 101. All right, first word for today is agrimony. A-G-R-I-M-O-N-Y. This is a noun from the 14th century. Any of a genus of herbs of the rose family having compound leaves, slender spikes of small yellow flowers, and fruits like burrs, B-U-R-S. And the, uh, the genus mentioned was agrimonia, uh, and especially A. eupatoria. Next we have agritourism. This is a noun from 1978. The practice of touring agricultural areas to see farms and often to participate in farm activities. Next, we have the prefix agro, A-G-R-O, one, of or belonging to fields or soil, agricultural, as in agrochemical. And the uh, agricultural there was after a colon. I think it's just sort of a, 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 another part of the definition. We see that a lot, but I don't usually call it out as uh, after the colon. Number two, agricultural and We've seen definitions like this before. I think arrow, some arrow dash, A-E-R-O, was uh, dealing with aeronautics and. So in this case, the uh, example is agro-industrial. And the etymology is saying this is from the Greek agros, which means field. And there's more at the word acre. So go back a bunch of episodes and listen to acre. Next, we have agrochemical, which was one of the examples I just read. This is a noun from 1956, an agricultural chemical as an herbicide or an insecticide. Next is agroecology. This is a noun from 1967, an ecological approach to agriculture that views agricultural areas as ecosystems and is concerned with the ecological impact of agricultural practices. Agroecological is an adjective. Next is agroforestry. I wonder how many of these agro words we will have. This is a noun from 1977. Land management involving the growing of trees in association with food crops or pastures. Agroforester is a noun. Next is agroindustrial. This is an adjective from 1907. Of or relating to production as of power for industry and water for irrigation for both industrial and agricultural purposes. Next we have agronomy, A-G-R-O-N-O-M-Y. I'm guessing this is something like the study of agriculture. I'm, I'm thinking of like astronomy. Uh, the anomy is the suffix of that, and agro is obviously all this agricultural stuff that we've been seeing. So let's see what this one is. It is a noun from 1814, a branch of agriculture dealing with field crop production and soil management. Agronomic is an adjective, agronomically is an adverb, and agronomist is a noun. Next we have aground, A-G-R-O-U-N-D. This is an adverb or an adjective from the 13th century. One, on the ground, as in plains aloft and aground. Two, on or onto the shore of the bottom of a body of water, as in a ship run aground. Wouldn't it be a ship runs aground? I don't know. I'm sure they did that on purpose. Next, we have A-G-T, all lowercase. This is an abbreviation for agent. Next, we have ague. A-G-U-E, this is a noun from the 14th century. One, a fever as malaria, marked by paroxysms of chills, fever, and sweating that recur at regular intervals. Two, a fit of shivering. A guish is a very funny word, but it is also the adjective. Uh, a guish. Uh, this is from the Anglo-French ague, A-G-U-E, spelled the same, probably pronounced differently. Uh, Middle Latin acuta, ac- acuta which me- uh, literally means sharp fever. And there's more at the word acute. 
Next word is ah, a h. This is the first form of it. It is an interjection from the 13th century. It's a Middle English, by the way. The, there's no other information for the etymology other than that. It is used to express delight, relief, regret, or contempt. Ah. Next, we have the second form of ah, and it just says it's a variation of ah, a a h. The one we're reading is a h. Uh, so you can probably go to the one of the very first episodes to read a a h. Next, we have again a h, but this is all caps. This is an abbreviation for one ampere hour or ampere hour. Uh, a m p e r e dash hour, like an hourglass or the hour hand. Two, ano hegerai or egerai, uh, looks Latin to me. Ano is a n n o. The second word is h e g i r a e. I will have to look up what that is. I'm actually a little surprised they didn't put in here what that means. Um, and three. Arts and humanities. I can read that just fine. Next we have aha, a h a. This is also an interjection、uh, from the Middle English, 14th century, used to express surprise, triumph, or derision. I believe it is also the name of a band. Next is aha again. This is all caps. It is a noun from 1991. And it stands for alpha hydroxy acid. Next is Ahab, capital A H A B. This is a noun from 1540. A king of Israel in the ninth century B.C. and husband of Jezebel. It's saying it is、uh, Hebrew from the name A H E A B H, and there's horizontal lines over the、uh, E and the A in the middle. And I believe this is also the name of the main character in Moby Dick, although I have never read it, and I probably should. Would you agree? Maybe you haven't read it either. Next is aha moment. This is a noun from 1939. A moment of sudden realization, inspiration, insight, recognition, or comprehension. I love it when I have an aha moment. Next we have achu. All right. It is spelled A H C H O O, and it is a variation of A C H O O, spelled A C H O O, which I'm sure we've already read. Next, we have ahead, A H E A D. This is an adverb or adjective from 1596, one A, in a forward direction or position, and forward is a synonym. One B. The entire definition just says in front. Two, in, into, or for the future, as in plan ahead. Three, in or toward a more advantageous position, as in helped others to get ahead. Four, at or to an earlier time, in advance, as in make payments ahead. Next, we have ahead of. This is a preposition from 1613. One, in front or advance of. Two, in excess of. Next we have ahem, a h e m. This is an interjection, and、uh, just before that it says a throat clearing sound, often read as ahem, just like I said it.、Uh, this is from 1603. The definition says used especially to attract attention or to express disapproval or embarrassment. Next we have ahi, a h i. This is a noun from 1898. One yellowfin tuna is the synonym, and two is big eye tuna. That's the also a, a synonym because it's all in all lower caps. The etymology is saying this is、uh, Hawaiian, so pretty much it's the Hawaiian word for tuna, or those two kinds of tuna. I don't know how many kinds of tuna there are. Maybe I should find out. Next and last word for this episode is ahimsa, a h i m s a. This is a noun from 1875. 
the Hindu and Buddhist doctrine of refraining from harming any living being. The etymology says this is a Sanskrit word, ahimsa, which means non-injury. And if you heard my last episode, you heard that uh, I choose not to eat meat and dairy for uh, ethical reasons. Uh, So I guess I'm practicing ahimsa. And that will be the end of the episode. Thank you very much for listening. And let's move on to episode 102. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary, read by me, Spencer. Yep, it's still me. I'm still doing this. We're over 100 episodes in, and I'm only on page 26, so I'll see you when I'm old. First word for today is ahistorical. It's the word historical with an A at the beginning. Oh, it could also be ahistoric. This is an adjective from 1911, not concerned with or related to history, historical development, or tradition, as in an ahistoric attitude. Also, historically inaccurate or ignorant, as in an ahistorical version of events. Ahistorically is an adverb, ahistoricism is a noun, and ahistoricity is a noun. Next we have a hold, A-H-O-L-D. This is a noun from 1854, and it just has the synonym hold. The definition just has the synonym hold, H-O-L-D, as in, if you could get a hold of a representative. That is from Norman Mailer. Next we have a suffix, dash, A-H-O-L-I-C, or dash, O-H-O-L-I-C, you could pronounce that aholic. This is a noun, and it is not giving me a year. Uh, One, one who feels compulsively the need to do something, as in workaholic. Two, one who likes something to excess, as in chocoholic. And the etymology, of course, has the word alcoholic. That is the one that we can all think of. I would almost call myself a chocoholic. I really try not to eat a lot of it, but I do love sweet things and chocolate in particular. I don't really like dark chocolate, but uh, because I don't have dairy, I have to have the darker stuff. That's a whole thing that I'm not going to get into. Moving on. Next we have a horizon, this is two words, first word is just a, uh, and then horizon, noun from 1907, the uppermost dark colored layer of a soil consisting largely of a partly disintegrated organic debris. I actually learned recently that the different layers of soils are called horizons, so the a horizon is the, uh, the top one. Next we have ahoy, A-H-O-Y. This is an interjection. This word actually just came up, um, I think it was yesterday. I was listening to a podcast, and I think it was uh, Conan O'Brien's podcast where he interviewed, oh boy, I'm blanking on his name, the star from Barry. I'll think of it. Of course, I, I, I do this all the time. I cannot think of the words that are like so obvious. Anyway, they were talking about The Simpsons and uh, Montgomery Burns. That has got to be the at least the second time I've brought up Montgomery Burns on this podcast. So, well, The Simpsons has played a big part in my life. Uh, so Montgomery Burns, when he picks up the phone, he goes, Ahoy, hoy. And that was brought in because, I guess, originally when the telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell, he wanted people to say ahoy hoy when they answered the phone and it did not catch on but uh montgomery burns uh keeps it alive anyway this is from 1748 it is used in hailing as in ship ahoy the etymology says uh the a is from uh aha and plus hoy i don't know why where hoy comes from, but that's what it is telling me. Next we have Araman or Araman, uh, capital A, 
H-R-I-M-A-N. This is a noun from 1728. Ahura Mazda's antagonist, who is a spirit of darkness and evil in Zoroastrianism. The etymology says this is a, a Persian modified of av, anro, minus, uh, which is hostile spirit or which is a hostile spirit. I also feel like I need to look up who Ahura Mazda is, and I wonder if that's where the car company Mazda got its name from. And funny I should mention that, because the very next word is Ahura Mazda. Capital A, H-U-R-A, space, capital M, A-Z-D-A. This is a noun from 1850. The supreme being represented as a deity of goodness and light in Zoroastrianism. I don't know a lot about Zoroastrianism. Uh, I live near a Baha'i temple, and we were there showing it to a friend of ours because it is an absolutely gorgeous structure. And they have a, a welcome center where people, uh, volunteers, can, can teach you about it. Um, and Zoroastrianism is mentioned. All religions are mentioned there, actually. But I really don't know much about it, so maybe I'll have to look into that. I actually really want to learn a lot more about a lot of uh, religions or all of them because I did not grow up religious, and so I only know the very basics of a few of them, uh, but I feel like I should learn more. And the etymology says this is, oh, the A-V, I don't know what that means. Uh, it was in the previous word, too. Uh, but this one is the word Ahura Mazda, all one word, literally means wise God. Next we have... AI, all caps. This is an abbreviation for one, ad interim, two, airborne intercept, three, air interception, four, artificial insemination, and five, artificial intelligence. And you might have heard my stomach growling. I need to go eat some food soon. Next, we have AIA, all caps. This is an abbreviation for the American Institute of Architects. Next, we have AIAS, A-I-A-S. The first A is capitalized. This is a noun from 1833, and it just has the synonym AJAX, A-J-A-X. I know that that is a cleaning chemical stuff thing, uh, but I believe it is also the name of something. Uh, well, the etymology says it's Greek, so it's it's from the Greek. Maybe it's one of the Greek gods. Um, we'll get to that in at least six episodes. Next, we have Ablins, A-I-B-L-I-N-S. This is an adverb from circa uh, 1605. This is chiefly Scottish, and it just has the synonym perhaps. Ablins, so all of you Scottish listener, listeners out there, Ablins, I know what this word means, I guess. Next, we have the word aid, A-I-D. This is the first form. It is a verb from the 15th century. Transitive definition is to provide with what is useful or necessary in achieving an end. Intransitive definition says to give assistance. Aider, A-I-D-E-R, is a noun. The etymology pared down says this is from the uh, Latin ad plus juvare, which means to help. The second form of aid is a noun from the 15th century. One, a subsidy granted to the king by the English parliament until the 18th century for an extraordinary purpose or extraordinary, if you prefer to say it that way. 2a, the act of helping. 2b, help given. Assistance is a synonym, as in providing aid and comfort. Specifically, tangible means of assistance, as money or supplies. 3a just has the synonym aid, a-i-d-e. 3b, something by which assistance is given an assisting device, as in an aid to understanding, or a visual aid, especially a hearing aid. 4. A tribute paid by a vassal, vas vassal to his lord. Apologies, I don't know the word V-A-S-S-A-L. 
although I'm sure I've seen it many times. I just don't know how to pronounce it properly. Next, we have AID again. This is all caps. This is an abbreviation for one, Agency for International Development. Two, Artificial Insemination by Donor. We have another AID. This is A-I-D-E, all lowercase. This is a noun from 1777. A person who acts as an assistant, specifically a military officer who acts as an assistant to a superior officer. The etymology says this is short for the word aide de camp, which is our very next word. A-I-D-E dash D-E dash C-A-M-P. This is a noun from 1670. A military aide. Also, a civilian aid usually to an executive. This is from uh, French. It literally means camp assistant. And I think that we will end it there. That is the last episode of this. No, that is the last word of this episode. Thank you again for listening. I've got one more to record while sitting on this floor with an aching tush. And, uh, but then after that, I can go stop and eat some food. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. I've been saying that a lot recently. First word for today, uh, I believe it is pronounced aid memoir. Yeah, aid memoir. Uh, A I D E dash M E with a with an accent over it dash. No, there's no dash there. That's all one word. Uh, let's start that one over again. A-I-D-E dash M-E-M-O-I-R-E. And as mentioned, the first E in memoir is uh, has a dash over it. That was partly why I was pronouncing it funny or having trouble with it, because I didn't realize memoir was one word, and I know that word, because people write books called memoirs, or as... That guy said it in that movie, Memoir. John Malkovich, that's who it was. And I believe the movie was Burn After Reading? Coen Brothers movie? Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay, definition. This is a noun from 1836. One, an aid to the memory, especially a mnemonic device. Two, a written summary or outline of important items to a proposed agreement or diplomatic communication. Next, we have aid man, all one word, A-I-D-M-A-N. This is a noun from 1941. An army medical corpsman attached to a field unit. Anytime I see a, a word that was um, first used in the maybe late 30s, late 1930s, or early 1940s, I assume that it is war-related in some way, and this is one of those. Next, we have AIDS, all caps, A-I-D-S. This is a noun from 1982. This is a big one, not just in uh, definition length, but just a big word in general. A disease of the human immune system that is characterized cytologically, especially by reduction in the numbers of CD4-bearing helper T-cells to 20% or less of normal, thereby rendering the subject highly vulnerable to life-threatening conditions as pneumocytosis carinae pneumonia and to some as Kaposi's sarcoma that become life-threatening and that is caused by infection with HIV commonly transmitted in infected blood especially during illicit intravenous drug use and in bodily secretions as semen during sexual intercourse. So let's look at this. Uh, Illicit intravenous drug use. Yes, that is obviously one of the cases. But if I'm not mistaken, this has happened uh, in a hospital uh, when somebody's getting a blood transfusion Um, Maybe that's because the person didn't tell them that it was in their blood or they didn't know. Uh, Probably not because the needles were dirty or hadn't been cleaned or sterilized. But it's not just uh, illicit intravenous drug use or sexual intercourse, although 
yes, those are probably the two largest reasons that people uh, get HIV and then possibly AIDS. The etymology is saying this is the entire word is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Next, we have AIDS related complex. AIDS dash related, second word complex. This is a noun from 1984. A group of symptoms as fever, weight loss, and lymphadenopathy that is associated with the presence of antibodies to HIV and is followed by the development of AIDS in a certain proportion of cases. Next, we have AIDS virus. This is a noun from 1983. Interesting that those were uh, 82, 83, and 84, although not in that order. Uh, the definition just has the synonym HIV, which we will get to later. Next, we have the word aigrette, A-I-G-R-E-T-T-E. This is a noun from 1630. One, a spray of feathers, as of the egret, for the head. I don't know what that means. Does that mean that the feathers are on the head and they call it a spray? That like, like, like it's spraying out of its head? Not sure. Two, a spray of gems worn on a hat or in the hair. All right, so I need to see photos of this. Uh, the etymology says this is from the French. Uh, I guess it, it is a French word. It means plume or egrette. Uh, it is from the Middle French, and there's more at the word egrette, E-G-R-E-T. Next, we have the word aiguille or aigui. Thank God for the pronunciation because I would have trouble with these. It is spelled A-I-G-U-I-L-L-E. Uh, this is a noun from 1809, a sharp pointed pinnacle of rock. This is French, again, literally means needle. And there's more at the word aglet or aglet. And, of course, Needle reminds me of Game of Thrones and will remind me of Game of Thrones forever. Next, we have another French word, aiguillette, A-I-G-U-I-L-L-E-T-T-E. -E. This is a noun from 1812. Synonym is aiglette or aglette, just like the last one. Specifically, a shoulder cord worn by designated military aides. And it says, compared to the word for Roger, F O U R dash R E G E R E. There's a dash of some kind over the second to last E. Uh, the word goes over to the second line, uh, which is why there's a dash, but I don't know if the word normally has a dash. And I'm not going to go ahead and look in the F's for that. So if you want to know, you can go look that up. Next, we have the word Aikido. We have left France and we have gone into Japan. A-I-K-I-D-O. This is a noun from 1956. A Japanese art of self-defense employing locks and holds and utilizing the principle of non-resistance to cause an opponent's own momentum to work against him. As I said, this is from uh, the Japanese word, also spelled the same way, Aikido. Ai, A-I, means match or coordinate. Ki means breath or spirit, and do means art or way. Next, we have the word ail, A-I-L, first form of it. This is a verb from the 12th century. In tra no, transitive definition is to give physical or emotional pain, discomfort, or trouble to, as in this floor is ailing my legs and butt. Intransitive definition is to have something the matter, especially to suffer ill health. The etymology says this is from the Old English eglan, E-G-L-A-N, which is akin to goth. I don't know what goth stands for. Um, aglian, A-G-L-J-A-N, which means to harm. Second form of ale is a noun from the 13th century, and it just has the synonym ailment. Next, we have the word ailanthus, A-I-L-A-N-T-H-U-S. This is a noun from 1789. Any of a small Asian genus of chiefly tropical trees and shrubs with bitter bark, pinnate leaves, and terminal panicles of ill-scented greenish flowers, 
especially the tree of heaven. The genus mentioned is Ailanthus of the family Simarubacae. The etymology says this is a new Latin from uh, Camarian, which is Austronesian language of the Piru Bay region. Seram, S-E-R-A-M. Uh, it is I Lanito, which literally means the sky tree, or from the Khanate phrase in a related central Moluccan language. Moluccan is M O L U C C A N. Next we have Aileron, A I L E R O N. This is a noun from 1909. A movable airfoil at the trailing edge of an airplane wing that is used for imparting a rolling motion, especially in banking for turns. And it says, see the illustration at the word airplane, which we will get to later. This is from uh, the French diminutive of the word ale, A-I-L-E, uh, which means wing, and there's more at the word aisle, A-I-S-L-E. Next, we have ailment, A-I-L-M-E-N-T, a noun from 1657. One, a bodily disorder of chronic disease. Two, has the synonyms unrest and uneasiness. Next word is ilurophile. It's a lot of, a lot of new words I'm learning. A-I-L-U-R-O-P-H-I-L-E. This is a noun from 1914. A cat fancier. A lover of cats. This is from the Greek iluros, which means cat. I had no idea that an ilurophile was a lover of cats, or rather that a lover of cats is called an ilurophile. I would have thought it would be like a felinophile or something like that. But I guess they use the Greek form. Next is ilurophobe, and I'm going to just take a wild stab in the dark and say that this is someone who is afraid of cats. Uh, this is a noun from 1905. A person who hates or fears cats. There are a lot of ilurophobes out there, but I think that if they got to know some cats, uh, some more cats, they might not be so much of an ilurophobe, and they might be an ilurophile. We have two cats that are great and uh, sometimes lap cats. One is much more of a lap cat than the other one is, but they, uh, they're very friendly and playful. Uh, there are a lot of cats that are mean, which is probably why people end up being ilurophobes. Next word is aim, A-I-M. First form of it, this is a verb from the 14th century. Intransitive definitions. One, to direct a course, specifically to point a weapon at an object. Two, we have the synonyms aspire and intend as in she aims to win. Transitive definitions. One is obsolete, just has the synonyms guess, G-U-E-S-S, -S, and conjecture. To A has the synonym point, as in aim a gun. To B, to direct toward a specified object or goal, as in a story aimed at children. The etymology is saying this is from a Latin Esmer, E-S-M-E-R, which means to estimate. I have pared that down greatly. Second form of aim and last word for today is a noun from the 14th century. One is obsolete. It has the synonyms mark and target. 2A, the pointing of a weapon at a mark, as in take careful aim. 2B, the ability to hit a target, as in a shooter with good aim. To see a weapon's accuracy or effectiveness, as in the gun's aim is off. We are now at the top of page 27 just to finish this one up. 3 is obsolete. 3a, conjecture and guess are synonyms, and I think they were synonyms of something else before. 3b, the directing of effort toward a goal. 4 a clearly directed intent on purpose, as in, our aim is to win. Uh, and then, at the end, we have a synonym for the whole thing. It says, see the word intention. Aimless is an adjective. Aimlessly is an adverb. And aimlessness is a noun. 
And that will end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. Next time, we are going to start at the top of page 27 minus four lines. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. This is Spencer with another episode of The Dictionary. Today, I am recording these in the same audio booth that I have been using, but I am in a chair. The last time I recorded was yesterday, which would be the previous four episodes, uh, and I was sitting on the floor, and I don't know why I didn't grab a chair, so my butt hurt real bad. Uh, But today, I am in a chair, so apologies if you hear some squeaking every once in a while. All right, first word for today is the top of page 27, AIM, A-I-M, all caps. This is an abbreviation for American Indian Movement. Next, we have A-I-N. Uh, I guess it's pronounced AIN. This is an adjective from 1721. It is Scottish, and it just has the synonym OWN, O-W-N. It says it is probably from the... Uh, O-N, maybe that's Old Norse. Um, Eigen, E-I-G-I-N-N. Next word is ain't, A-I-N, apostrophe T. I'm a little uh, surprised to see this word in here. Um, There's a lot of usage information at the end, so we will get there. This is a contraction of R and not. It is from 1749. Number one, am not, are not is not. Each one of those is separated by colons. Uh, Two, have not or has not. Ain't is a very uh, versatile word, it looks like. Uh, Three, do not, does not, and did not. Uh, It says used in some varieties of black English. Usage says, although widely disapproved as non-standard and more common in the habitual speech of the less educated, Ain't, in senses one and two, is flourishing in American English. It is used in both speech and writing to catch attention and to gain emphasis, as in the wackiness of movies, one so deliciously amusing ain't funny anymore. That is from Richard Schickel. Also as in, I am telling you there ain't going to be any blackmail. That is from R. M. Nixon. Uh, Richard Milhouse Nixon. Everything's coming up Millhouse. It is used especially in journalistic prose as part of a consistently informal style, as in the creative process ain't easy. That's from Mike Royko. This informal ain't is commonly distinguished from habitual ain't by its frequent occurrence in fixed constructions and phrases, as in, well, class it ain't. That's from Cleveland Amory. Also as in, for money... Say it ain't so, Jimmy. That's from Andy Rooney. Also as in, you ain't seen nothing yet. And that ain't hay. And two out of three ain't bad. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That was a lot of examples. In fiction, ain't is used for purposes of characterization. In familiar correspondence, it tends to be the mark of a warm personal friendship. It is also used for metrical reasons in popular songs, as in Ain't She Sweet and It Ain't Necessarily So. Our evidence shows British use to be much the same as American. All right, moving away from Ain't, we have Ainu, capital A-I-N-U. This is a noun from 1817. One, a member of an indigenous people of the Japanese archipelago, the Kuril Islands, and part of Sakhalin Island. Two, the language of the Ainu people. Next we have Aioli, A-I-O-L-I. This is a noun from 1896, a mayonnaise flavored with garlic and sometimes other ingredients as red pepper. The etymology says this is Occitan. I know I've seen this word before, O-C-C-I-T-A-N, I'm not exactly sure what that is, so yeah, maybe I should look that up. Uh, It is from I-A-I, which means garlic, and oli, which means oil. Next, we have the word air, A-I-R, something that we all breathe. This will be the last word for today, as it is very long. Uh, It's the first form of it. Not sure if I said that. This is a noun from the 14th century. 1A is archaic, 
It just has the synonym breath. 1B, the mixture of invisible, odorless, tasteless gases as nitrogen and oxygen that surrounds the earth. 1C, a light breeze. Ah. 2A, empty space, like what's in my brain. 2B, the synonym nothingness, as in vanished into thin air. 2C, a sudden severance of relations, as in she gave me the air. 3, it says it was probably translated from the Italian aria. Uh, 3A, has the synonyms tune and melody. 3B, says it's in uh, Elizabethan and Jacobian music, an accompanied song or melody in usually strophic form. 3C, the chief voice part or melody in choral music, or chorale music, although I think that would have an E at the end, and this one doesn't. Uh, 4A, outward appearance of a thing, as in an air of luxury. 4B, a surrounding or pervading influence. Atmosphere is a synonym as in an air of dignity. For D, an artificial or affected manner, as in put on airs. Five, public utterance, as in he gave air to his opinion. Six, we have the synonym compressed air. Seven, A, one, the synonym aircraft, as in go by air. Seven, A, two, the synonym is aviation, as in air safety or air rights. 7A3, air force is the synonym, as in air headquarters. 7B1, we sure do have a lot of these. The medium of transmission of radio waves. Also, we have the synonyms radio and television, as in went on the air. 7B2, the synonym is airtime. 8. A football offense utilizing primarily the forward pass, as in, trailing by 20 points, the team took to the air. 9. An air conditioning system. 10. The height achieved in performing an aerial maneuver, as in, a snowboarder catching big air. Also, the maneuver itself. And then at the end, it says, the synonym says, see the word pose, P-O-S-E, Airless is an adjective, airlessness is a noun, in the air means in wide circulation, and also the synonym about, and then up in the air means not yet settled. That was the first form of the word air. Uh, I think we've had 10 definitions in uh, previous words, or maybe one word, but I don't know if we've had this many A's and B's and 1's and 2's and things like that. So this one may take the record for most uh, definitions, but I'm really not keeping track. That will end this episode. We are going to start the next one with the second form of air. And thank you for listening. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the Dictionary. Let's get into it with the second form of the word air, A-I-R. This is a transitive verb from 1530. 1. To expose to the air for drying, purifying, or refreshing. Ventilate is a synonym, and it's often used with the word out, O-U-T. 2. To expose to public view or bring to public notice. 3. To transmit by radio or television, as in air, a program. Now we have the intransitive definitions. 1. To become exposed to the open air. 2. To become broadcast, as in the program airs daily, just like this podcast. And then at the end we have the synonym express. Next is air bag, two words. This is a noun from 1969. An automobile safety device consisting of a bag designed to inflate automatically, especially in front of an occupant in case of collision. Next is air ball, also two words, noun from 1981, a missed shot in basketball that fails to touch the rim and backboard. And I find this interesting that this was first used in 1981 because basketball existed for many decades before that. And so I'm curious what they used pre-1981 for 
A ball that misses everything. Next is air base two words. This is a noun from 1915. A military base chiefly for the operation of aircraft. Next is air bladder. Noun from 1731. A sack containing gas and especially air, especially a hydrostatic organ present in most fishes that serves as an accessory respiratory organ. And there is a picture of a fish, and it has uh, a little line pointing to where the air bladder is. And it's kind of right in the middle. Next, we have air boat. This is all one word, a noun from 1914. A shallow draft boat driven by an airplane propeller and steered by an airplane rudder. Next is airborne, A-I-R-B-O-R-N-E. This is an adjective from 1637. One, done or being in the air, being off the ground as 1A, carried through the air as by an aircraft. 1B, supported especially by aerodynamic forces or propelled through the air by force, as in a plane becoming airborne. You always want the planes to become airborne. 1C, transported or carried by the air, as in airborne allergens. 2. Trained for deployment by air and especially by parachute, as in airborne troops. Next we have air break, two words. This is a noun from 1846. 1. A brake operated by a piston driven by compressed air. 2. A surface that may be projected into the airstream for increasing drag and lowering the speed of an airplane. And I've always uh, found air brakes interesting because it's not like a brake on a, on a car. Uh, so let's just look at the number two definition again because I think that's the more uh, accurate one for an airplane, uh, the airplanes that I take. So a surface that may be projected into the airstream for increasing drag and lowering the speed of an airplane. And so when you uh, look at the wings of a plane, uh, especially when they land, um, but I think also while it's flying, there are, um, I guess you'd call it a rudder, there are things that can uh, kind of move up and down and that will uh, slow the airplane. Next we have air breathing. There is a dash in the middle of those words. This is an adjective from 1938 of employing or being an engine that requires air for combustion. Next we have air brush, all one word. This is the first form. It's a noun from 1884. An atomizer for applying by compressed air a fine spray as of paint or liquid color. Second form of airbrush. Transitive verb from 1907. To paint, treat, or alter as to conceal imperfections with or as if with an airbrush. As in, airbrush a photograph. Next, we have air burst, all one word. This is a noun from 1914, the burst of a shell or bomb in the air. Next is Airbus with a capital A. This is a trademark used for a subsonic jet passenger airplane. Next is Air Chief Marshal. This is a noun from 1919, a commissioned officer in the British Air Force who ranks with a general in the Army. Next is Air Commodore, C-O-M-M-O-D-O-R-E. This is a noun from 1919, a commissioned officer in the British Air Force who ranks with a brigadier in the Army. And clearly Air Chief Marshal and Air Commodore are related very closely. Next we have Air Condition. There's a dash in between the two words. This is a transitive verb from 1914. To equip as a building with an apparatus for washing air and controlling its humidity and temperature. Also, to subject air to these processes. Air conditioner without the dash is a noun, and air conditioning is also a noun. And next and last word for this episode is aircraft. This is a noun from 1845, a vehicle as an airplane or balloon for traveling through the air. 
That was a very informative and quick episode. Thank you for listening. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds, and welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Let's get into it. We are halfway through page 27 with aircraft carrier. First word. This is a noun from 1917. A warship with a flight deck on which aircraft can be launched and landed. Next, we have air crew. This is all one word. It's a noun from 1918. The crew manning an airplane. That's it. Next, we have air cushion vehicle. There is a dash between air and cushion. It's a noun from 1958. We just have the synonym hovercraft, which I think is a much more interesting word instead of air cushion vehicle. Although air cushion vehicle is um, more accurate, I think it's more clear when you hear air cushion vehicle because it's uh, a vehicle on a cushion of air. It's a big pillow with air in it. Uh, hovercraft, they don't, they don't hover. Uh, I'm not aware of any hovercrafts that actually hover yet. Uh, maybe one day we will get there. I do remember back many, many years ago when Back to the Future 2 came out, uh, they had the hoverboards, and my cousin, who was just a few years older than me, was convinced, convinced that we had the technology to actually create hoverboards. And my dad told him he was absolutely wrong, and I think we know who won that argument. Next, we have air dam, two words. Uh, this is a noun from 1970, a device attached to the underside of the front of an automobile to improve stability, aerodynamic performance, and engine cooling by re redirecting the flow of air. Next, we have air date. It's probably not when you go on a date and there's no one there who they stood you up, and so it's an air date. Uh, this is a noun from 1950, the scheduled date of a broadcast. Next is air drome, D-R-O-M-E. Uh, this is a noun from 1917. It just has the synonym airport. Uh, the etymology says it's an alternative air of aerodrome, A-E-R-O, which looks like the British spelling. Next, we have airdrop. This is a noun from 1943. Delivery of cargo, emergency supplies, or personnel by parachute from an airplane in flight. Airdrop with a dash is a transitive verb. Airdroppable is an adjective. Next, we have air dry with a dash. It is the first form of air dry. It's an adjective from 1846. Dry to such a degree that no further moisture is given up on exposure to air. Second form of air dry is a transitive verb from 1886. To dry by exposure to air. Intransitive definition is to become dry by exposure to air. I have said the word air. I have no idea how many times since three episodes ago, two episodes ago. Next is Airedale Terrier, or is it Erdale? I think it's Erdale, uh, capital A-I-R-E-D-A-L-E, -E, and then Terrier, which is a dog. Uh, this is a noun from 1880. Any of a breed of large terriers with a hard, wiry, black and tan coat, called also Airedale. The etymology says uh, Airedale is a valley of the Air River in England. So these terriers must come from India. And uh, after looking at the etymology of some of these other words, I realized that it is Airedale, not Erdale. Uh, it's just spelled that way in the f uh, phonetic description. Moving on, next is error, A-I-R-E-R. It's -E a hard word to say. Uh, this is a noun from 1817. It's British, a frame on which clothes are aired or dried. Next, we have airfare, A-I-R-F-A-R-E. This is a noun from 1917, fare for travel by airplane which is often very expensive, but sometimes you can get cheap flights. Although I do recommend not taking the flights like uh, Spirit, 
because you have to pay for everything extra unless you're literally just bringing one bag and that's it, and you don't care where you sit. Next, we have air field, all one word. This is a noun from 1919. An area of land from which aircraft operate as a, the word airport, that's the synonym, and b, the word air base is also a synonym. Next, we have air flow. This is a noun from 1878. A flow of air, especially the motion of air, as around parts of an airplane in flight relative to the surface of a body immersed in it. Next, we have air foil, A I R F O I L. This is a noun from 1919. A body, as an airplane wing or propeller blade, designed to provide a desired react reaction force when in motion relative to the surrounding air. And I'm noticing a lot of these air-related words are from the early 20th century, um, 1919, 1917, uh, around that time, and I'm guessing that is uh, around the time when the airplane was invented, and I should probably know when the Wright brothers made the first airplane that worked, but I don't know, so I will have to look that up, but I'm guessing it is right around that time. Next, we have Air Force. Two words. This is a noun from 1911. One, the military organization of a nation for air warfare. Two, a unit of the U.S. Air Force higher than a division and lower than a command. Next, we have Air Frame. This is all one word. It is a noun from 1930. The structure of an aircraft, rocket vehicle, or missile without the power plant. Also, we have the synonym aircraft. Next is air freight. This is a noun from 1918. See, there's that uh, time again. Freight transport by air in volume. Also, the charge for this service. Air freight is also a transitive verb. Next, we have air glow, all one word. This is a noun from 1949. Light that is observed, especially during the night, that originates in the high atmosphere of a planet, as the Earth, and that is associated with photochemical reactions of gases caused by solar radiation. And I think we will do one more for this episode. Air guitar. Two words. This is a noun from 1980. An imaginary guitar that one pretends to play. Also, the action of playing air guitar. Um, I have been to two or three air guitar shows in Chicago. Uh, yes, this is a real thing. This is a worldwide competition of air guitar playing. Uh, when I saw it, I think the first one I saw was the regionals, so it was just kind of the Chicago area. And then the other one I saw was actually the, uh, the nationals. So all of the winners from the regionals came to Chicago to compete, uh, perform and compete, and it's pretty amazing. And then the winner of the Nationals goes on to the world competition. I think it's in Finland. Um, and we've actually had, I think, a hometown uh, Chicagoan perform there. I don't know if he won, uh, but he has definitely performed there. So Air Guitar is a very fun show to watch. That will be the end of the episode. Thank you for listening. And uh, the next episode will be the end of page 27 and for you Weird Al nerds, that means something to you. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, Word Nerds. I'm so excited that you're here. I'm here to let's talk about words. First word for this episode is air gun. Two words. This is a noun, circa 1753. One, a gun from which a projectile is propelled by compressed air. Pew, pew. Two, any of various hand tools that work by compressed air, especially the synonym airbrush, which we have said before. Next, we have airhead, the first form. It is all one word. It is what I am. It is a silly movie from the 90s. Airheads. This is a noun from uh, circa 1943. An area in hostile territory. What? Okay. An area in hostile territory secured usually by airborne troops for further use in bringing in troops and material by air. 
I was not aware of that. I was expecting something else, which I assume is the second form. Uh, the etymology says this is air plus head, duh, as in beach head. All right, that wasn't uh, terribly descriptive or helpful. Uh, so the second form of airhead is a noun from 1971. Yeah, I guess I should have realized 1943. They may not be using the word airhead. Uh, it's more war related. So this one is a noun from 1971. As I said, a mindless or stupid person. Airheaded is an adjective. Next, we have air hole, all one word. Let's find out what this says. Noun from 1601, a hole to admit or discharge air. Next, we have airing, A-I-R-I-N-G. This is a noun from uh, 1587. One, exposure to air or heat for drying or freshening. Freshening? Yes. As in, give the room an airing. Two, exposure to or exercise in the open air, especially to promote health or fitness. And we all should be healthier and more fitnessier. Three, exposure to public view or notice. Four, a radio or television broadcast. Next, we have air kiss. There is a dash. This is a transitive verb from 1975. To greet from a distance with a kissing motion of the lips. And oftentimes some people like to put their hand in front and blow the kiss away. Uh, air kiss can also be a noun. Next we have air lane, L-A-N-E. This is two words. It's a noun from 1909. A path customarily followed by airplanes. So, if we look back to the previous episode, I mentioned something about thinking that the uh, Wright Brothers airplane was invented sometime around 1917 to 19. Uh, well, I guess a little bit before that. And uh, this is from 1909, so that pushes everything up about 10 years. Again, I haven't had time to look it up because I'm recording four episodes at once. So maybe later, when I'm done with this, I will go look up when the Wright Brothers invented the plane. And I don't feel like doing it now. Next, we have air letter. Two words. This is a noun from 1918. One, an air mail letter. Two, a sheet of air mail stationery that can be folded and sealed with the message inside and the address outside. And boy, I so wanted that to say that it is a sheet of air mail stationery that could be folded into an airplane that you throw and send it to the person you want it to go to. But that's not it. Next, we have air lift, all one word. This is a noun from 1943. A system of transporting cargo or passengers by aircraft, often to or from an otherwise inaccessible area. Air lift is also a transitive verb. Next, we have air line, all one word. It's a noun from 1901. An air transportation system, including its equipment, routes, or roots, depending on what you want to say, operating personnel and management. So airlines existed all the way back in 1901, which means that the Wright brothers probably invented the plane in the 1800s. And again, I should know this stuff. I should, I should, I'm pretty good with dates and years, but I have no memory of when they invented that thing. What airline do you use? Uh, United, American, Delta, JetBlue, Spirit, Iceland Air, New Zealand Air. New Zealand Air is actually one of the best airlines. They've been voted one of the best airlines, uh, I think, multiple times. I flew with them on Christmas Day, and they gave us stockings with stuff in them. Next, we have airline again, but this is two words. It's a noun from 1813, a straight line through the air between two points. Next is airliner. This is a noun from 1908, an airplane operated by an airline. Next, we have airlock, two words. This is a noun from 1840, one, an intermediate chamber with two airtight doors or openings to permit passage between two dissimilar spaces as two places of unequal atmospheric pressure. Two, a stoppage of flow caused by air being in a part where liquid ought to circulate. 
Next, we have air mail, all one word. This is a noun from 1911. The system of transporting mail by aircraft. Also, the mail thus transported. And air mail is also a transitive verb. Next is air man, all one word. This is a noun from 1873. One, a civilian or military pilot, aviator or aviation technician. Two, an enlisted man in the Air Force as A, an enlisted man of one of the three ranks below sergeant. To B, an enlisted man ranking above an airman, basic and below an airman first class. That did not make much sense to me, but I don't know a lot about those things. Next, we have airman basic. So airman is one word, basic is the other word. This is a noun from 1952. An enlisted man of the lowest rank in the Air Force. And I'm sensing a pattern here. Next, we have airman first class. This is a noun from 1952. An enlisted man in the Air Force ranking above an airman and below a sergeant. Next is airmanship, all one word. This is a noun from 1859. Skill in piloting or navigating aircraft. It's kind of like sportsmanship, but it's airmanship, and you're flying a plane. Next, we have Air Marshal. This is a noun from 1919. One, a commissioned officer in the British Air Force who ranks with a lieutenant general in the Army. Two, we just have the synonym Sky Marshal. Next, we have Air Mass. Two words. This is a noun from 1882. A body of air extending hundreds or thousands of miles horizontally and sometimes as high as the stratosphere and maintaining as it travels nearly uniform conditions of temperature and humidity at any given level. I find meteorology interesting, uh, but not interesting enough to have decided to, to study it in any way. I know a couple of the names of clouds. I know that there's low pressure systems and high pressure systems, but I really don't understand what a lot of it means. Uh, maybe I have a little bit more knowledge than the average person, but not by much. Um, so I'm always fascinated when people know a lot about weather and the science behind it, because it's pretty interesting and we all have to deal with it. It, it exists because of the way the world is, the way it turns, the where the, uh, the land masses are, north and south and what's going on and it's it is really super fascinating why there are deserts and rainforests and tornado alleys and all that stuff it's really amazing how how the world works and nature works have i said enough about that yes i have next we have air mattress two words this is a noun from 1832 we just have the synonym, uh, or I guess the word mattress, 1B. All right, next is air metal, capital A, capital M. This is a noun from 1942. A U.S. military decoration awarded for meritorious achievement while participating in an aerial flight. Next is air mile, two words. This is a noun from 1907. A mile in air travel. So this is interesting because you'd think that a mile of air travel and a mile on the ground would be the same. Uh, I assume that the distance is the same, except for the fact that because you're in the air, you theoretically have longer to go or shorter to go. I'm not really sure of that. But yeah, there must be a difference between an air mile and like a, a land mile. Next and last word for today is air-minded, A-I-R-M-I-N-D-E-D. -E this is an adjective from 1924, interested in aviation or in air travel. An air-mindedness is a noun. That will end this episode and it will also end page 27. As I've said before, we are seriously chugging along here. Thank you very much for listening. If you want to give me money so I can do this, that would be awesome. There's a Patreon link in the description. If you want to send me an email or a tweet or Facebook thing, whatever, please do that or don't. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the full dictionary. Goodbye. 
Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of The Dictionary. Uh, so, first off, um, I checked my downloads this morning. Today is uh, Friday, May 17th, 2019. Uh, and something really incredible happened. My downloads went from an average of 10 or 15 a day to almost 250. Uh, so, yeah, don't know what happened, but uh, if that was you, thank you. Uh, it was probably just a couple of people downloading every single episode. And to whoever you are, I thank you very much. So let's get to the words. First word for today is air mobile or air mobile. This looks like one word, A-I-R-M-O-B-I-L-E. This is an adjective from 1959 of relating to or being a military unit whose members are transported to combat areas, usually by helicopter. Next, we have air park, all one word. This is a noun from 1908, a small airport usually near an industrial area. Next is air piracy, two separate words. This is a noun from 1948, the hijacking of a flying airplane, and the synonym is skyjacking. I guess uh, in the movie Con Air, you could say that that was some air piracy going on. Next, we have airplane, all one word. This is a noun from 1906, and it is an uh, alternative version of aeroplane, A-E-R-O. A powered, heavier-than-air aircraft with fixed wings from which it derives most of its lift. And we have a little picture of a an airplane with... 23 numbers uh, pointing to various parts of the plane. Since you can't see it, um, I, I will slightly describe what's going on. But here we have airplane. Number one is the weather radar, and that looks like it's right in, in the nose of the plane. Two is the cockpit. That's where the windows are, almost at the very front, just behind the nose. Uh, three is jet engine. Uh, this is just one of the engines that is below the wing. There's four engines on this plane. I do not know planes, so I couldn't tell you if it's a 737 or a 2940 or whatever. Uh, four is engine pod, and it looks like that's just right in the same area as the jet engine. Five is pylon. Uh, looks like that is what attaches the engine to the wing, I'm guessing. Uh, six is the entire wing. Seven is the vertical stabilizer. So that is in the very back with those uh, kind of mini wings. It's the part that goes vertical. And I'm guessing it keeps the plane stable. Uh, eight is the rudder. So that is the piece on the vertical stabilizer that uh, can move back and forth. Uh, I'm guessing to uh, help it steer. Um, it's at the top of the vertical stabilizer because we have 9 and 10 which are below the rudder. 9 and 10 are tabs, uh, so it looks like 10 is pointing to the vertical stabilizer, but it is also pointing to uh, one of the uh, mini wings in the back there. Uh, 11 is the elevator. This is uh, not the kind of elevator that we are used to. This is... Um, one of the mini wings, or it's at the very end of the mini wing, and I don't know the proper name for the mini wing. Uh, wait, maybe I do. It is 12, the horizontal stabilizer. Uh, so in the back, we have the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal stabilizer, and there's one on either side, the left and the right. 13 is inboard flap. This is uh, on the back of the wing, uh, all the way towards the body of the plane. Next is uh, 14, inboard spoiler. Um, also, in fact, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19 are all um, on the back of the wing, and they go in order from the body of the plane out to the end. Uh, so again, 14 is the inboard spoiler. Uh, 15 and 16 are tabs. 17 is the aileron, or aileron, A-I-L-E-R-O-N, 18 is an outboard flap, uh, and 19 is an outboard spoiler. 20 is a sound suppressor. This looks like it's on the back of the jet engine under the wing. 21 is a thrust reverser. 
this is right in front of the sound suppressor on the jet engine. 22 is cabin air intake. So this looks like it's right, it's at the bottom of the body of the plane, uh, kind of in between the wings. 23 is the fuselage, and that is um, also on the body of the plane in front of the cabin air intake. And 24, I think I said there were 23, but I missed 24. 24 is the nose landing gear, and that is just right below uh, the area of the cockpit. It's the wheel that comes down. Well, that took up some time. Uh, next, we have air plant. Two words. This is a noun from 1798. One is the synonym epiphyte, E-P-I-P-H-Y-T-E. Two, any of several calanchos, especially calancho pinata. All right, calancho is uh, K-A-L-A-N-C-H-O-E, and then S is the plural. And the, uh, I guess that's the scientific name, calancho, spelled the same way, uh, pinata, P-I-N-N-A-T-A. Next, we have airplay, all one word. This is a noun from 1942. The playing of a musical recording on the air by a radio station. As in, a song getting a lot of airplay. Next, we have air pocket, two words. This is a noun from 1912. A condition of the atmosphere as a local downdraft that causes an airplane to drop suddenly. So that would probably be the cause of some turbulence, which I know a lot of people are very scared of. I think turbulence is kind of fun. I like roller coasters, so that up and down motion I I enjoy. Uh, But I know some people really freak out about it. I have heard stories uh, when people weren't wearing their seatbelts and the plane dropped a ridiculous amount, 10, 20 feet, something like that. And I think they hit their head on the ceiling because their seatbelt was not on. So... If you are one of those people who doesn't wear a seatbelt on a plane, I strongly suggest that you start doing that um, anytime you're sitting in your seat because you never know when you're going to hit an air pocket. Um, I'm actually flying tomorrow morning, so I will be sure to wear my seatbelt. Next, we have air police, two words. This is a noun from 1927, the military police of an air force. Next is airport. And we'll just say that this will be the last uh, word for this episode. Uh, This is a noun from 1902. A place from which aircraft operate that usually has paved runways and maintenance facilities and often serves as a terminal. I think it's kind of funny that they say usually has paved runways uh, because there are some airports that are extremely tiny and don't, I guess. Uh, That would be pretty freaky to to land a plane on a not paved runway. Uh, But we will end there. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Thank you and goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another exciting adventure in the dictionary. Uh, We are starting with air post. One word, A-I-R-P-O-S-T. This is a noun from 1911, and it just has the synonym air mail. Just another name for that. Next is air power, all one word. It's a noun from 1908, the military strength of a nation's air force. Next is air pump, two words. This is a noun from 1653, and apologies if, you, uh, if you're hearing that puff of air when I say puh sounds. Uh, again, still, I don't have that mesh in front of the microphone. But hopefully we can get that fixed soon. Air pump is a pump for exhausting air from a closed space or for compressing air or forcing it through other apparatus. Next is air quotes, two words. This is a noun from 1989. A gesture made by raising and flexing the index and middle fingers of both hands that is used to call attention to a spoken word or expression. And of course, air quotes reminds me of Chris Farley's character on uh, Saturday Night Live. I think it was when they would do Weekend Update or when he was on Weekend Update and he would put air quotes in the, uh, the strangest places. That is a, a good memory from my childhood. And if you haven't seen that, I will put a link. I'll see if I can find a link and put it in the uh, episode details. 
Next is air rage, two words. Uh, before I even read the definition, I, I know of road rage, when you get really pissed uh, by, at somebody when you're driving a car. I really want this to be a, um, a pilot getting really pissed at other pilots and their planes, and then they get air rage. But I'm sure that's not it. Uh, noun from 1977, an airline passenger's uncontrolled anger that is usually expressed in aggressive or violent behavior. I find this fascinating. Uh, also that it was just coined in 1997. I really wonder what event caused or spurred this word to be created. Was there a specific person who uh, had some air rage? It's really interesting to look back at people using airplanes um, over how many ever decades it's been. People would dress up to go on an airplane. It was a big deal. Uh, They would serve meals in uh, very fancy dishes These days, you have to pay for a meal, um, if there even is one available for purchase. People are going in sweats. Um, I don't really care one way or the other, but it's just interesting to notice how how things have changed. Um, And I don't think people used to get really mad uh, on airplanes, but these days people expect so much or people are... I don't even know what the word is. People are very interesting, so they get really mad about the littlest things. And uh, it has uh, happens often enough that we have now coined a term, air rage. But enough of that. Moving on, this is air raid, a noun from 1909. An attack by armed airplanes on a surface target, usually hyphenated when used attributively, as in air raid shelter. That's air dash raid shelter. I guess, should I be calling these hyphens? I don't know. There's there's dashes and hyphens and M dash and N dash, and I never know which one is the right one to use, so I just say dash. Next, we have air rifle, two words. This is a noun from 1801. A rifle whose projectile, as a BB or pellet, is propelled by compressed air or carbon dioxide. Next, we have air right. That is a R-I-G-H-T, two words. Uh, It's a noun from 1922. A property right to the space above a surface area or object. So this is an interesting concept. It's basically saying like if you've got a building and uh, you have the air rights to the space above you, literally the air above you. I'm not saying that everybody who owns a building has those air rights, but, you know, that that is a possibility. I obviously don't know what the uh, the rules and laws are for that. But that's, that's an interesting concept, to own the space above you. Next, we have air sac, S-A-C, two words. This is a noun, circa 1805. One, one of the air-filled spaces in the body of a bird connected with the air passages of the lungs. I recently was, I think I saw a video about how birds can create their um, amazing little melodies and I guess they have, or many birds have, two larynxes, larynxes, um, and they can produce sounds in both, and so they can get very complex. And I'm guessing these uh, air sacs help in the creation of that. Two, we have the synonym uh, alveolus 1b. Uh, alveolus is spelled A L V E O L U S. Three, a thin-walled dilation of a trachea occurring in many insects. Next, we have air screw, all one word. It's probably a screw uh, that is used in an airplane. This is a noun from 1859. This is chiefly British. It is an airplane propeller. So the propeller just goes around and around like a screw does, uh, but it's not actually a screw for a plane. Next, we have airship, all one word. This is a noun from 1826. A lighter-than-air aircraft having propulsion and steering systems. So that would be like a, um, I guess a hot air balloon would probably be considered an airship. I don't know how much you can steer one of those things, but you must be able to to some degree. I would love to go up in one of those one day. Um, Also, the um, Zeppelin um, or the a blimp, those would be airships. Next, we have air show, 
two words. This is a noun from 1912. An exhibition of aircraft and aviation skills. I live in the Chicago area, and every year uh, the air show comes to town, and uh, I have been in the city um, a couple of times the day, the couple of days or the week before the actual air show, and the planes are rehearsing their, their things, and so it's, a, it's been very interesting and very loud uh, to be down there for that. Next, we have air sick, all one word. This is an adjective, circa 1785, affected with motion sickness associated with flying. Air sickness is a noun. What did they have in 1785 that people would go flying in? I am very curious about this. I, I'm assuming hot air balloons, probably. Um, I, I'm not sure when those other uh, forms of flying were created, but I know planes weren't created until... Well, I didn't look it up since the last episode that I recorded uh, when I was talking about that, but it was probably the late 1800s, very, very early 1900s. Uh, so I don't know what people were in that got them air sick. Luckily, I do not get air sick. Next, we have air space, all one word. This is a noun from 1911. The space lying above the earth or above a certain area of land or water, especially the space lying above a nation and coming under its jurisdiction. So that would also be uh, a case where we could use air right. Right? Is that what the word was? I'm trying to find it. Yep, air right. The country has uh, air rights to the space above it. Next, we have air speed, all one word. This is a noun from 1909. The speed, as of an airplane, with relation to the air. And it says compared to ground speed. I've always been curious what the difference between these was. Uh, I mean, I guess the air is moving, so if it's windy, your airspeed will be different, uh, I guess, when it's not windy. Uh, I'm, the, I'm just basing that off of what it says. The ground isn't moving, although technically I guess it is moving at a very, very high speed. So if it's like 10,000 miles an hour, maybe when we're driving on the highway, we should say, we're going 10,070 miles an hour. That would be awesome. Next is air stream, all one word. This is a noun from 1719. A current of air, specifically the synonym air flow. Next is air strip, all one word. This is a noun from 1911. A runway without normal air base or airport facilities. Next we have ert. I think it's pronounced ert or ert. Uh, A-I-R-T. This is uh, the first form of it. It is a noun from the 15th century. It is chiefly Scottish, and it means compass, point, and direction is a synonym. The etymology says this is from the Middle English, and then in parentheses it says Scottish, art, A-R-T, and it is from the uh, Scottish Gaelic ert, A-I-R-T, but it doesn't really say what those words mean other than, I guess, compass point or direction. I would love to hear that used in a sentence. Any of you Scottish people, uh, please give me an example. Next, we have the second form of ert. This is a transitive verb from circa 1782. Again, this is chiefly Scottish, and it just uh, has these synonyms direct and guide. Next, we have air taxi. This is a noun from 1919. A small commercial airplane used for short flights between localities not served by scheduled airlines. Luckily for air taxi drivers, they don't need to learn a lot of streets like they do in London for those regular uh, streetcar taxi drivers. Next is air tight, all one word. This is an adjective from 1728. One, impermeable to air or nearly so, as in an airtight seal. Two, A, having no noticeable weakness, flaw, or loophole, as in an airtight argument. Two, B, permitting no opportunity for an opponent to score, as in an airtight defense. Airtightness is a noun. Next, we have airtime, all one word. This is a noun from 1924. One, 
the time or any part thereof that a radio or television station is on the air. 2. The time at which a radio or television broadcast is scheduled to begin. Next we have air to air. Air dash to dash air. 2 is spelled T-O. This is an adjective from 1939, launched from one airplane in flight at another, as in air-to-air missiles, also involving aircraft in flight, as in air-to-air combat. Next is air vice marshal. Vice marshal has a, it's hyphenated. I'll, I'll start using that. Uh, this is a noun from 1919, a commissioned officer in the British Air Force who ranks with a major general in the army. Next we have air wave, all one word. Adjective from 1944, of, created for, or heard on the airwaves. And air waves is our next word, all one word. Noun from 1900, the medium of radio and television transmission, not used technically. Next is airway, all one word. Noun from 1800, 1. A passage for a current of air, as in a mine or to the lungs. 2. A designated route along which airplanes fly from airport to airport, especially such a route or route equipped with navigational aids. 3. Just has the synonym airline. 4. A channel of a designated radio frequency for broadcasting or other radio communication. Next and last word for this episode, airworthy, A-I-R-W-O-R-T-H-Y, adjective from 1829, fit for operation in the air, as in, kept the historic aircraft in airworthy condition, and airworthiness is a noun. Thank you very much for listening through all those air words, and we have a couple more to go. And until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye. Hello, word nerds. Welcome to another episode of the dictionary. Uh, I was talking to somebody who has another podcast, and uh, he gave me a little suggestion of how to maybe make this uh, podcast a little bit more interesting. Uh, He mentioned just having some background music. Uh, If you think this is a good idea, let me know. If you think it's a bad idea, let me know. If you don't care, let me know. If you have other ideas, let me know. Uh, He is a music guy, so I asked him if he would maybe write a little something that uh, could be looped underneath uh, underneath me. That sounds weird. Um, That can be put in the background uh, because the lengths of these episodes are different. Um, And if we do that, it would have a nice little opening. So, you know, you can have some nice, beautiful music to listen to at the beginning of these episodes. And it would have a nice ending as well. Uh, Whether or not this happens, I have no clue, but that was just a conversation I had a little bit ago. All right, let's get to the words. First word for today is airy, A-I-R-Y. This is an adjective from the 14th century, 1A, of or relating to air. Atmospheric is a synonym. 1B, high in the air. Lofty is a synonym, as in airy perches. 1c. Performed in air. Aerial is a synonym. Aerial is spelled A-E-R-I-A-L, as in airy leaps. 2. Has the synonyms unreal and illusory, or illusory, I-L-L-U-S-O-R-Y, as in airy romances. 3a. Being light and graceful in movement or manner. Synonyms are sprightly and vivacious, as in an airy dance. 3b. Exceptionally light, delicate, or refined, as in an airy fragrance. I don't think I have one of those. 4a. Open to the free circulation of air, as in an airy room. 4b. Having openings or spaces, as in airy lacework. Five has these synonyms affected and proud, as in airy condescension. Airily is an adverb, and airiness is a noun. Next we have airy fairy, that is hyphenated. 
Uh, it's an adjective from 1837. One is chiefly British.、Uh, it has these synonyms delicate and fairy like.、Uh, two is also chiefly British, lacking substance or purpose, as in, in an airy, fairy, unserious, insufficiently careful fashion. That is from、uh, the Times Lit Sup, and I know I saw that in the past, and I don't remember what, or I don't, I still don't know what that、uh, stands for. Uh, to me, this is probably a phrase that shouldn't really be used anymore. It, I think it definitely has some、uh, negative connotations to many people. So, apologies for that one. Next, we have "isle." A I S L E. I think I remember as a kid seeing that word and being like, "That's that's not how isle is spelled," or that word isn't pronounced isle.、Uh, wh- why why is the s there? Uh, this is a noun from the 15th century. One, the side of a church nave separated by piers from the nave proper. Two, a one, a passage, as in a theater or railroad passenger car, separating sections of seats. One, a two, such a passage regarded as separating opposing parties in a legislature, as in. Supported by members on both sides of the aisle, to be a passage, as in a store or warehouse for inside traffic. When I'm on a plane,、uh, which is appropriate because we were just talking about planes a couple episodes ago, or just one episode ago,、um, I like the aisle seat. I、uh, I used to like the window seat just because it was really awesome to look out the window, and I will never not like looking out the window. Uh, because it's really cool to see stuff from way up there. But、uh, if I have to go to the bathroom, I hate disturbing the people that are next to me. So I much prefer to be on the aisle, and can get up whenever I like. And I try to drink a lot of water to stay hydrated. So that's what I do.、Uh, regarding、uh, legislature and and people on both sides of the aisle, we're seeing less and less of this these days. And and when we do see people on both sides of the aisle coming together on an issue. Uh, it's really impressive, and it warms my heart. But we need to see more of it,、uh, and I'm shocked that we don't. Etymology for "isle" says it is from、uh, the Middle English "isle," I-L-E, which is an alternative of "ele," and that is from the Anglo-French,、uh, which literally means "wing."、Uh, that's from Latin "ala," A-L-A, which is akin to the Old English. Oh, I don't know how to pronounce that. E-A-X-L. Which means shoulder, and there's the Latin axis,、uh, which means axle tree, and there's more at the word axis. I am so confused and fascinated by how all those are related. Next, we have aisle way, a i s l e w a y. This is a noun from 1872, and it just has the synonym aisle to be. So what we just read. Next we have eight a i t. This is a noun from before the twelfth century. It is British and it means a little island. The etymology says this is from the Middle English it e y t, which is from the Old English、uh, egit e g e t,、uh, by form of egoth or igioth、uh, i g g o t h or i g e o t h. Which is from ig, ig, which means island, and there's more at the word island. And I recently learned, although now I'm maybe questioning it,、um, I recently learned that、uh, the country Iceland,、um, in their in their language, they they spell it like we spell island, i s l a n d,、um, is i s is、uh, ice, you know, frozen water.、Um, and so I actually asked、uh, one of our tour guides. Is that where we get the word island? Because Iceland is an island, and he said yes. He said that our English word、uh, island is from is the spelling of Iceland.、Uh, you know whether or not that's true. Maybe I have to dig a little deeper. But that's what he said. Also in Iceland,、um, I was there. That's why I had a tour guide. We were talking about this.、Um, the the first geyser or or the first named geyser. Um, is in Iceland and it's pronounced,、uh, I think, Geysir, spelled G E Y S I R. So supposedly, that's where we get the word geyser from. 
But we will move on. Next word is H. A I T C H.、Uh, so that's, you know, the letter H. That's how it's pronounced. And this is the word for it, maybe.、Um, this is a noun from circa 1580. And the definition says the letter H. That's, that's what it is. Next, we have H bone, all one word. This is a noun from the 15th century. One, the hip bone, especially of cattle. Two, The cut of beef containing the H bone. I have never heard H bone before, especially in regards to meat,、uh, but there you have it. Next is a jar, A J A R. I know I've mentioned this before, but we are finally to this word.、Uh, this is an adjective from the 15th century. Slightly open, as in, left the door ajar. Next we have Ajax with a capital A. This is a noun from the 15th century. One, a Greek hero in the Trojan War who kills himself because the armor of Achilles is awarded to Odysseus. Two, a fleet footed Greek hero in the Trojan War. I'm not sure why those two definitions are separate. It seems like they could be the same person,、uh, but maybe not. Next, we have Ahi, A J I. I think it's Ahi. Uh, this is a noun from 1822. A chili pepper that ranges in pungency from mild to very hot. Pungency, I typically think of as、uh, its smell,、um, but I also wouldn't necessarily say the smell is mild or the smell is hot or very hot. But you, you, know, you could definitely smell the heat on, on something.、Um, so I wonder, maybe pungency can be used to.、Uh, To talk about heat and、uh, in terms of flavor.、Uh, this is from the American Spanish ahi,、uh, which is from the、uh, Taino, T A I N O, oxy. Maybe it's pronounced ahi as well, A X I. Next we have ajaga. I, I'm guessing that's the pronunciation based on the little pronunciation guide. A J U G A. I have never seen this word before. Uh, this is a noun from 1806.、Uh, it just has the synonym bugle. And it looks like there is a superscript one before the word bugle. That is the, the little one that's at the top.、Uh, not sure what that means, to be perfectly honest.、Uh, the etymology says this is from、uh, Latin uh, jugum or jugum,、uh, which means yoke, Y O K E, and there's more at the word yoke. Next, we have AK, all caps. This is an abbreviation for the state of Alaska. I have an employee, I don't have any employees. I have a co worker whose initials are AK, and for some reason, we pretty much just all, all call her AK. I don't know why, honestly.、Uh, next, we have AKA, all lower caps. This is an abbreviation for also known as. Next is Akan, or Akan. Akan,、uh, capital A K A N. This is a noun from 1694. One, a member of any of the Akan speaking peoples as the Ashanti. I have no idea who the Akan people are,、uh, but I think I'm going to get a little bit more information in the next definition, which is number two. A Kwa language, K W A, of southern Ghana and the southeast Ivory Coast. So, I'm assuming that's where the Akan,、uh, the people who speak Akan live.、Um, Ashanti, I, I, I know somebody named Ashanti. Hey, Ashanti, how are you? Next, we have AKC, all caps. This is an abbreviation for the American Kennel Club. And next and last word for today is Aki, A K E E. This is a variation of. Aki, spelled A C K E E, which we read many, many episodes ago. And that will end this episode. Thank you very much for listening. I feel like these episodes are getting longer. I think I might be talking more. Weird.、Um, all right, until next time, this is Spencer reading the dictionary. Goodbye.